thanks so much. It's so, thank you for that. It was very lovely. I know it's sad when people read my bio, it sounds really dreary. I mean, it sounds like I spent all this time in prison and doing really awesome topics. But I, I mean, I actually just think it's really dramatic. That's why. I'm really like it. And this topic in particular has always been something of great interest to me, and it's something that I'm going to be following again um, in the coming months with another story that, that we're going to be putting out on on this. Um, so we're going to talk about the economics of being a private prison company. So let's say that you own a private prison company. Um, you've got a lot of problems, but um, you've got a lot of issues you got to deal with all the time. I mean, it's prison, you know. But at the same time, you're a publicly traded company with shareholders, and at the very end of the day, your business model comes down to who's in prison. And if you look at crime in the United States, you can see that it was it, there was a huge crime peak in the late 80s and early 90s that has tapered off quite substantially. And ever since 2000, pretty much holds, held steady, and in the past two years, actually declined quite a little bit. Um, this is important because the people you put in your prisons are the people who commit crime. So you have a great interest in crime and have <coughs> crime is playing out. And you can also see that it's the same thing that's happening with property crime, where it peaks at the same points and then comes down. Even in a bad economy, we still property crime is still falling in, in the United States. Um, you know, if you're, if you're looking at how many people you can lock up, if this is something that <coughs> of interest, because this, this peak that you had in, in the late 80s and early 90s when you first started your company, when you first came into the business, suggested that you were going to be just raw, I mean, you were never going to be shy of prison beds because that was the time of the crack epidemic in the United States. And it was the introduction of crack cocaine onto the streets. And what ended up happening was it was just outright warfare. And so there were a lot of tough on crime policies came out of that. And then in the early 1990s, the crack market stabilized. So what you have happening is that when these markets stabilize, the crime rate starts dropping. And it surprised a lot of criminologists that it has stayed low. A lot of criminologists that I've talked to said that they actually expected that it was going to spike again, that the recession was going to cause crime to go back up. It just hasn't happened. People thought you know, terrorism was the new, people were going to get angry, upset, or stressed, and that this was going to cause crime that didn't happen either. And it's really just held steady. So until you know the next crack wave, uh, we're sort of in this situation. So this is relevant to you and your prison company um, because you care about the imprisonment rate. And things are going great. Things are going real well up through the beginning of your company, through the 90s. And even in the early 2000s, you're, you're holding strong. And then all of a sudden, you start seeing this blip a few years ago where your, your imprisonment rate is, is flatlining. And, in, and for the first time last year, it actually dropped for the first time in 34 years. Um, and this, <coughs> to your prison company, is a really big problem. Because in 2010, the prison population declined in 26 states. So 26 states have fewer inmates in prison than they did the year before. And if you own a publicly traded prison company, you answer to your shareholders and to your investors, and you have to show not only that you are a solid, economically strong company, but that you have the potential for growth. And you no longer have a potential for growth when crime looks like that, the rate looks like that, and 26 states are cutting their prison populations. And for states, and for the public, this is a good thing, because who wants crime? And uh, prisons are really expensive. I mean, you're spending $25,000 a year per inmate on, you know, in the prisons. California is spending more on its, high, as much money on its higher education program as it is on its uh, prisons. So prisons, so states are saying, we cannot afford this anymore. We are tapped out, especially in these sort of tough economic times which started in 2008. States have just really turned this around and said, we've got to, we, there's got to be something else that we can do 
with all of these offenders. And so a lot of states have started doing drug courts and probation and parole, and they're diverting inmates away from $25,000 a year incarceration and into these sort of alternate paths. And, and, that, and that's a difficult situation for a company that has to show growth, the potential for growth. So what you see uh, starting a few years ago is that the prison companies, GEO Group and CCA, Corrections Corporation of America, is the largest private prison company in the country. Um, it has $1.67 billion in, profit, in revenue every year. And you start seeing that this concern is showing up in their SEC filings. Like, this one up here, economic conditions remain very challenging, putting continued pressure on state budgets. States may be forced to further reduce their expenses if their tax re revenues, which typically lag the overall economy, do not meet their expectations. So they're saying, uh-oh, shareholders, look out. You know, there's trouble on the horizon. And then, again, in their annual report in 2010, as of June 2010, we had approximately 11,000 unoccupied beds at facilities that had availability of 100 or more beds and an additional 1,000 beds under construction in Nevada, we have staff throughout the, uh, throughout the organization actively engaged in marketing this available capacity to existing and prospective customers. Filling these beds will provide substantial growth in revenues and earnings per share, but they're empty right now. So in, in 2010, they've got 11,000 unoccupied beds. And before, if you looked at their reports from you know, 10 years back, they didn't have any. They couldn't build enough prisons. There were, there were so many inmates that needed a place to go. There were so many states that were expanding their prison populations. It was, it was boom times. And now, not only are they not growing, but they've got way too many empty beds. And so one of the things that I found um, really interesting is that uh, in their 2009 report, is when you, especially with Corrections Corporation of America, you start seeing this same, uh, you start seeing them talking about illegal immigration. So the demand for our facilities and services could be adversely affected by the relaxation of enforcement efforts, leniency in conviction or parole standards, and sentencing practices through the decriminalization of certain activities that are currently prescribed our, in our criminal laws. For instance, any changes with respect to drugs or controlled substances or illegal immigration could affect the number of persons arrested, convicted, and sentenced, thereby potentially reducing demand for correctional facilities to house them. So they are openly acknowledging that, that if, if they're losing their customers because of crime policies or immigration policies, that that's going to affect their bottom line. And that's what they're telling their shareholders. Um, well, you know, you see this also with um, with Geo Group as well. And I think I'm actually going to hold on and play that one for a second. But um, where, so if you're running this prison company, where do you find your growth? Where are you going to go to start finding some people to fill 11,000 empty prison beds? And not to mention that you're also trying to build more facilities on speculation, hoping that if you build it, that the uh, prison population will come and that the states will say, oh, it's there, we'll just uh, use that then. Um, so where are you going to go? So if you look at all the crime trends of crimes that are going up and down, what people are being arrested for, the majority of things are declining. There are fewer people being arrested for drugs. There are fewer people being arrested for murder. There are fewer people committing these crimes. And um, the only place where that is different is illegal immigration. So this is from the Bureau of Justice Statistics uh, annual report. This is their 2005 report. They're always way behind on their stats, but um, not to be true. Um, but so what what you can see here, this is this is all the federal arrests, right? And this is what people are being arrested for. And the number one thing that people are being arrested for is illegal immigration offenses. So 27.3% of all of the federal government's immigration arrests are for illegal immigration. And that is very different from just even in 1995. So in 1995, you, illegal immigration was 
and now it's 27%. It's more than doubled. And it's the number one thing that people are being arrested for on, on a federal level. So I would go there. That's where I would go. That's where I would look at that, and I would say, well, that's our growth. That's where we're going to find, find our, our folks that can fill up some of these empty beds. Um, in order to do that, you're going to have to get through to the Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency. You know, I mean, that's who, that's who we're talking about. I mean, that's who's, that's who's arresting and locking up the folks, right? They, they run, they hold the money. So you're going to need to figure out how you can get into this market and get in and build, move your prison facilities over to a federal, you know, into a federal facility and try to get some ICE contracts. And how do you do that? Well, you're going to have to do some lobbying. So, this is just, I just pulled this one sample because uh, this is what, something that interests me. So, if you're going, so if you look at CCA and you look at Geo Group, they spend millions of dollars lobbying. A little bit of, you know, Bureau of Prisons, a little bit of Homeland Security, a little bit, uh, you know, Department of Justice, and a lot Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, they have, if you look at CC, okay, so CCA over two years, 2008 to 2010, spent four and a half million dollars lobbying just, uh, lobbying, you know, federally. And if you look at, if you look at all 43 of those lobby, this is one of them, these lobbying disclosure forms, they all have to file this. When you lobby in the federal system, you have to file this. This is their, one of their, one of their many lobbyists. Um, they be strategic consulting. I think this contract was for $80,000, and uh, they wanted to lobby the provisions of funding related to immigration and customs enforcement. I mean, maybe, maybe they really want to get into, you know, checking bags at the airport. <laughs> but I think that it's probably more immigration that they're interested in. So this one was for $80,000, and if you look at the 40, let me check. Let me check. So I'm gonna get it wrong. Yeah, okay, so if you look at the 43 filings over those two years where they're lobbying the federal government, all, but, uh, all of them except for five say that, they're, that this money is going to, uh, to lobby for appropriations or policy with the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. That is the focus of their lobbying. It's not the Bureau of Prisons, you know, you might, that seems like an obvious one, it's not, you know, Justice Department or things like that. It's the Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And it's not just that they want it to lobby you know, for a contract. They're lobbying for policy. They're saying in here that we would like to, that we want to talk about the provisions in these bills. That's what they have to be pretty specific about what they're lobbying for. Um, so this is really, I mean, this is important to them because if you can't get some of these ICE contracts, then you know you're you're in some trouble because this is where this is where your new money is, and and of course it is because if you look at how much it costs to house somebody in an immigration and customs enforcement facility, they pay big bucks. They pay one hundred twenty-two dollars a day. Now that's not as much as they do in New York City. I think New York City is like two hundred. I think the commissioners here, but it's a little it's a little more pricey in, in New York City. But compared to states. Uh, $122 a night per inmate, it, that's a good deal. That's, that's good money. So if you times 122 inmates times 365 days times the facility that houses 2,000 people, that's $89 million a year for one facility. CCA operates 60 of these facilities. Geo Group operates 53. M&T operates 20-something of these facilities. That's really big money. Now it's expensive. You know, you gotta you gotta pay the, the you gotta you gotta house these people. You gotta pay for correctional officers. You have to pay for their food and some, some clothing. But there are some ways you can mitigate some of those costs too. I mean, you can negotiate you know a, a deal with your commissary accounts. You can talk about. Um, how much you know the inmates are going to pay for their M&Ms and what kind of a cut you're going to get from that, and uh, and you can also negotiate with your food vendor and how you, if it's going to cost how much, how much of a uh, how much can you lower that rate down? Um, there's a lot you can do to sort of mitigate some of your costs when you're operating a private.
correctional um, facility. And in some, in some cases, you don't have to worry as much about correctional officer unions because a lot of their employees are not unionized. So your costs are going to go down on that, too. In one state, I think, I don't want to name the company because I'm not sure, but one of the prisons is paying less than Walmart to be a correctional mm -hmm. officer. So, um, I don't know, where would you work? <laughs> so, um, there, there, the effect of the lobbying of private prison corporations on ICE, and I'm sure other elements of the federal government as well, but has been very effective because ICE, when you look at their budget that is solely directed to the incarceration, the ID, the, the picking up of the, of the transporting, and the um, deporting of illegal immigrants, that their budget just since 2006 is up 52%. So somebody's listening to somebody and raising that budget. And in, in a recent ICE meeting um, testimony in, on Capitol Hill, an ICE official said, look, we need more money because we have very, we, this is very expensive and we just need a higher a rating. And uh, one of the farmers said, why do you need more? And he said, well, we were going to pay $99 a night, but now we've got to pay $120, and that's just the negotiations that we've got going on, and so we need more money from Congress. And Congress gives it to them because it's Immigration and Customs Enforcement, and who doesn't support Immigration and Customs Enforcement? Um, and especially, because, especially what you see in a lot of these lobbying reports is that they are lobbying for the appropriations bill that funds ICE. They want to see more money put into ICE because then ICE can pay them more money to house a lot of these, these immigrants. Um, so uh, when, if you look at uh, SB 1070, here's a bill coming down the pike that's a, it's, it's a virtual bonanza for private prison companies because this bill could potentially lock up thousands and thousands and thousands of illegal immigrants. Um, that's worth a lot of money to these companies. And so, um, if you're wondering, like, you know, how, you know, if they're aware of it or whatever, I want to play this one. This is going to be kind of archaic here. I have to go back. Um, to, hold on. We have to go back. Here it is. For all the attention. So here's the Geo Group's investor call right after the law got passed. And this is a, an investor on the call that's asking the CEO, um, Wayne Calabrese, what he thinks of Arizona 1070. On the request for comment. In May, one of the prison companies, the Geo Group, had a conference call with investors. When asked about the bill, company executives made light of it. What bill? Any thoughts on the impact from the recent Arizona immigration legislation? Well, they have some legislation, I think, Then the company's president, Wayne Calabrese, cut in. Clint, this is Wayne. I can only believe that the opportunities at the federal level are going to continue to pace as a result of what's happening. Those people coming across the border and being caught are going to have to be detained. That, to me, at least, suggests there's going to be enhanced opportunities for what we do. Opportunities that prison company respond to requests for comment. Okay. In May. So now, sorry, I have to go back. There's a better way to do this, I know, but we don't do a lot of PowerPoint anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Arizona was coming, they were clearly happy about it, and made the man laugh. You know, it, 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 what legislation? You know, it's funny. Um, and and he's saying, essentially, at the end of my conference call, yeah, we're expecting things to continue apace. This is good. You know, we're expecting our opportunities to increase. And opportunities for them is, is dollars, it's money signs, but what they're really talking about is people. You know, these are people that are going to be put in, in their prisons. And in most cases, the vast majority of them are nonviolent, non-criminal people whose offense, their criminal offense is crossing the border. That's the problem. But other than that, they've been rather good members of society since they've been here. Um, and it's also talking about children. These are children that are going to be filling these facilities because they're illegally here too. 
So um, I don't know why it's, it, you know, when to them, when you hear, when I've listened to so many hours of these conference calls, it's very, it's not people, it's, it's numbers. It's just, it's just economic growth. It's where they stand uh, in the marketplace. Um, if you're a private prison company and you like this law, SB 1070, and you uh, want to see it passed, you know, what are you going to do? You know, you could hire somebody, you could hire lobbyists and have them go around to all the different states and you could have them go to all the different, you know, state capitals and he could go in and knock on lawmakers' doors and say, hey, you really got to pass this 1070, it's a, it's a great bill. Or you could just pay to have them come to you. And that, that's uh, what the majority, that's what the Corrections Corporation of America did essentially with the American Legislative Exchange Council. Now, I was going to spend about six minutes describing the American Legislative Exchange Council and what it does, and then I realized that I might as well just play the piece for you that I did about the American Legislative Exchange because it basically did it better than I can do it right now because it has sound and tape and we love sound and tape and NPR. So if you bear with me and indulge me, I'm just going to, and then we can talk about uh, 1070 and, and uh, let's do it again. Somebody's out there going, why don't you just do it the normal way? We were following up this morning on our report on Arizona's immigration law. Yesterday we met an Arizona lawmaker who sponsored the bill. He's a longtime opponent of illegal immigration. We also learned about an alliance of legislators and corporations that helped him to draft the legislation. Today, NPR's Laura Sullivan investigates that group. Walk into the offices of the American Legislative Exchange Council, and it's hard to imagine this is the birthplace of a thousand pieces of legislation introduced last year in state houses across the country. It's quiet, almost dark. Michael Bowman is the senior director of policy here. He explains only 28 people work here, and they are not writing the bills. In many cases, corporations are. Most of the bills aren't written by outside sources and companies, attorneys, judge councils. Here's how it works. ALEC is a membership organization. Some of the members are state legislators. They pay $50 a year in dues. Other members are private corporations, like Reynolds Tobacco, Exxon Mobil, Pfizer. They pay tens of thousands of dollars a year. All told, tax records show as much as $6 million. With that money, the 28 people in these offices put on three conferences a year. The companies sit around a table and write bills with state legislators, who then take them home to their states. Sponsor the bill. Senator Pierce. Madam Chairman, committee members, thank you very much. This bill is... Uh... One of those bills was Arizona's controversial immigration law. It requires police to arrest anyone who cannot prove they entered the country legally when they're asked. Hundreds of thousands of illegal immigrants could be locked up, and private prison companies stand to make millions. The largest prison company in the country, the Corrections Corporation of America, was present when the model legislation was drafted at an Alec conference. Alex Michael Bowman says that's nothing unusual. We usually pass about 200 bills a year. So it's, effective. I mean, it's an effective way to get a bill passed. Yes, it is. But, but let me just say, it's not an effective way to get a bill passed. It's an effective way to find good legislation. Most states define lobbying as pushing legislators to create or pass legislation. And that comes with rules. Companies have to disclose to the public what they are lobbying for and how much they're spending on it. If these conferences were interpreted as lobbying, the group could lose its status as a nonprofit. Corporations wouldn't be able to reap tax benefits from joining. And legislators would have a hard time justifying attending a conference of lobbyists. Bowman says what the group does is educational. Alec allows a place for everyone at the table to come and debate and discuss and to ask questions. And you have legislators who will ask questions much more freely in our meetings because they're not under the eyes of the press, they're not under the eyes of the voters, they're just trying to learn their policy and understand it. Much about Alec is private. It's finances, it's donors. Alec rarely grants interviews. Bowman won't even say which legislators are members. You've got private corporations that are paying money to sit in a room with legislators. Half the time, you said, bringing forth legislation that they themselves have written in the hopes that those legislators will bring it back to their states. You're a former lobbyist. Is that lobbying? No, because we're, we're not advocating any position. 
we don't actually lobby it. We don't tell members to take these bills. We don't ask them to vote for the bills. We just expose best practices. And so all we're really doing is developing policies that are in model bill form. So for example, last December, Arizona Senator Russell Pierce sat in a hotel conference room with representatives from the Corrections Corporation of America and several dozen others. Together, they drafted model legislation that was introduced into the Arizona legislature two months later, almost word for word. Bowman says this kind of meeting is just informational. But first, Alec has to get legislators to the conferences. They encourage them to bring their families. Corporations sponsor golf tournaments and throw parties at night. <coughs> Interviews and records obtained by NPR. Bowman says that's nothing special. Breakfast is in lunch. They're at like Marriott's and Hyatt's. They're just normal chicken dinners. Maybe one night they actually make it steak. And yeah, we feed the people. We think that you know they pay to eat at a conference. Videos and photos from the recent conference show banquets, open bar parties, and baseball games, all hosted by corporations. Tax records show the group spent $138,000 to keep legislators' children entertained for the week. But the legislators don't have to declare these as corporate gifts. Consider this, if a corporation hosts a party or a baseball game and legislators attend, most states require the lawmakers to say where they went and who paid. In this case, though, legislators can just say they went to Alex conference. They don't have to declare which corporation sponsored these events. Kirk Adams is Arizona's Speaker of the House. He went to Alex's recent gathering in San Diego. If we were to believe that a dinner with a lobbyist would purchase a member's allegiance to their issue, and we have much larger problems than that. It's just simply not um, been my experience at all. You pay your own way to the Alec conference? Um, I have accepted scholarships from Alec and <laughs> <laughs> Here's how it works. Alex Michael Bowman says legislators get something called a scholarship to cover conference expenses. But it's unclear where that money is coming from. Senator Russell Pierce used one of these scholarship funds to come to the annual conference. Who paid for that? That's Senator Russell Pierce. I mean, probably various corporations and lobbyists in the state help pay for it them to go to the event. But there's no public record of who would pay for that. No. Pierce said he received the money from Alec. Alex Michael Bowman later said Arizona legislator Bob Burns would know. Burns was in charge of pooling money for scholarships. But Burns did not respond to NPR's request asking where the money came from. Hi. Hi. Can I take a look at the state legislators' financial disclosure warrants? Oh, um, in an office at the Arizona State House, a review of records showed that not one Arizona legislator who went to the conference reported receiving any gifts of meals, parties, baseball, or banquet tickets from a private corporation. Senator Pierce and a dozen others wrote that they received a gift of $500 or more from Alec. A review of the two dozen states now considering Arizona's immigration laws shows many of those pushing similar bills across the country are Alec members. In fact, five of those legislators were in the hotel conference room with the Corrections Corporation the day the model bill was written. The prison company didn't have to file a lobbying report or disclose any gifts to legislators. They don't even have to tell anyone they were there. All they have to do is pay their alley dues and show up. Laura Sullivan, NPR News. Okay. So out of the ALEC conference room, out of this task force, this is the Public Safety and Elections Task Force, have come all of these bills. And on the elect Public Safety and Elections Task Force has been a very prominent member. It's, uh, they've always had on the board a member from the Corrections Corporation of America since the early 90s. In fact, three times since the early 90s, the Corrections Corporation of America has chaired this committee that has brought all of these bills onto the national stage. 
uh, truth in sentencing, um, lengths in prison sentences, mandatory minimum, 85% uh, of you serve 85% of your sentence, mandatory minimums, is minor drug crimes have to pay severe prices, three strikes are out, you commit two crimes, your third one you get life in prison, and then of course SB 1070. Um, and it's, you know, the way ALEC works, if you want to be on the task force board, you pay more money than if you just want to sit in the room. And if you want to chair the task force board, you pay more money. And in fact, ALEC, CCA's representation in ALEC goes even beyond that. They're even on an even a more powerful board that oversees uh, this thing. And once they get them in the room, it's really just the sales pitch at this point, because they've had multiple conference calls. Senator Pierce and, and uh, CCA got on conference calls before they showed up in the room. They chose the legislation that they were going to bring forward. And, uh, and, and once you get in the room, you've got a captive audience of 50 or so lawmakers, and you sell it. Now, CCA says that they do not uh, ever vote in any of these meetings, and that they are only there to monitor legislation. Uh, their job is uh, apparently, the, uh, they left ALEC uh, last year, but up until then, their job was simply to monitor what was going on in, in the meeting. Um, it's, it's possible. Um, you know, it's also possible that you could just subscribe to the ALEC magazine, which tells you all the legislation that's coming out of the Public Safety and Elections Task Force if you want to kind of monitor things that are going on. You probably wouldn't need to spend about a million dollars over the past uh, decade and a half to be in that conference room if you just want to monitor, you know, kind of or you could just you know sit in the back. I mean, you probably even sneak in. I mean, it's you know. Um, <laughs> so it's a lot of money to them. Now they've since pulled out. Geo Group also used to be uh, during the time that some of these law these laws were being passed. They pulled out. They pulled out uh, years ago, but they used to also be on the board of this uh, task force. And so these you know like mandatory mini minimums ended up in 27 states. And it's a you know you got you got a room full of lawmakers. You got a piece of legislation you love. You hand it to them. Get a little packet. It's nice and pretty. Here, go sell this. And you know, for lawmakers, especially for state lawmakers who are often part time, they're doing multiple. You know, they've got their real job, and then they come to the Capitol three months a year. You know, it's. I think that writing legislation, coming up with legislation, figuring out where you want to go with something is difficult. It's time consuming. You, where do you get the idea to have legislation? I think we all want to sort of. We have this idea that you know they go to a community meeting and think I'm going to fix this. I'm going to write this law that says you can no longer be blank because these people are all upset about it. But most of the laws come from places like the American Legislative Exchange Council and other similar organizations that write laws for you. They give you a packet and you can walk out the door with the pros of it. Here's how you use your media strategy. Here's your model legislation. Take it home. You know, head on out there. And, and, and I think some of the lawmakers I talked to said that it gives you the opportunity to, you know, come to, come to the party with something. You know, you've got, you pick the ones that you like. Even the ALEC, you, you choose the ones that interest you and then you, and then you show up. Um, so I know I need to open it to our questions at this point, but uh, uh, the one last thing I just want to say about, about CCA and 1070 is that when 1070 hit Arizona, I mean, the, the op groups that were in opposition to 1070 really never stood a chance because 30 of the 36 lawmakers that you know, co-sponsored it had gotten donations from prison companies or their lobbyists during the period that it was underway. In the first week that the legislation dropped, CCA hired a company called High Ground. Um, it's a very powerful Arizona lobbying firm. High Ground's run by Chuck Coughlin, who's Governor Janet Brewer's closest advisor and uh, also CCA's most prominent and largest lobbyist. He, um, there is a report by uh, a reporter, um, Morgan Lowe, in in Arizona that said that that uh, that. He, that Chuck Coughlin had had conversations with Janet Brewer about 1070 before she was while she was debating whether or not to sign it. So as he's having those conversations, is he her advisor, or is he representing the corporation that's paying him thousands and thousands of dollars to help pass the legislation that they support, whatever that legislation may be? Um, CCA says that they have never lobbied for. Arizona 1070. But I think that what my reporting has shown is that they were able to 
support its passage all the way through and, and in their presence in the Alec meeting, you know, help push it out to the rest of the country. Question? Otherwise, I'll just keep talking. Any, uh, anything about the Alabama, the recent Alabama law along these lines? Did you... So I have not delved into that thoroughly. It's on the list. Um, I've heard reports that uh, that there are some bloggers looking into that. So we'll just have to wait and see what comes out of it. But not yet. Yeah. Hello. Um, if I heard correctly, you said that companies such as Exxon and um, Pfizer. Um, give money to this American Legislation Exchange Council, why would these companies be interested in funding ALEC? Because if you, okay, so if you're a giant corporation and you have some legislation that you're interested in, maybe you don't want as much regulation in the marketplace, maybe you want uh, anything. I mean, the, the Bail Bonds Association is huge in ALEC and they are pushing very strongly right now to have People be released from prison, from prison, not from jail, from prison sentences on bail. I don't. I I, I read I read all of them. I still I don't know. I don't get it. I don't understand how that's going to work. But um, so they've got a piece of legislation that they believe in. They want this, and it's very difficult to get out to 50 states. So it's easier to go to a place where you can bring all the lawmakers to you, and you just pay their way and wine and dine them and they come in and have a great time and they come every year. I mean, 2,000 lawmakers show up to the American Legislative Exchange Council every year. But ALEC is expensive because you can't just show, you can't just like, and lawmakers pay 50 bucks, corporations pay $25,000 just to get in the door. So, um, yeah, do you, so it's, but it's worth it to them because it's, diff, it's more difficult to get a piece of legislation passed on the federal level and if you really want something to go your way, it's easier to go to the states and get it done on the state level. And here you've got 2,000 lawmakers eager to be there and ready to listen to you. And then you can, you know, take them to a baseball game just to be friendly, you know. Hi, uh, my name is Megan Martinez. Um, is there any evidence suggesting that perhaps there's also organizations involved in the lobbying for the construction of the Southern Fence that I know would take millions and millions of dollars and currently in the past few um, debates, presidential debates, mm -hmm. I know it's been brought up several times. You're talking about the contracting companies that want to build the fence? Yes. <clears throat> you know, it's an interesting point. It's probably worth looking into. Um, I wonder how much those contracts go for to build that fence. I mean, it hasn't gone very well, right? I mean, it's mm -hmm. starting and stopping it, and there's like giant holes through the golf course and whatever. Mm -hmm. And they but, still keep <laughs> on suggesting it, though, as a solution, even though it yeah. hasn't gone that well. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the fence. That fence issue is a trip. In fact, I do put a nugget in my mind, but maybe I'll look into that and see. Thank you. <laughs> Question? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Could, could you talk a little bit about how the, this financial process incentivizes counties and localities to sign on to 287G and secure communities agreements? I'm sorry, say the last one? How it incentivizes them to sign on to 287G and secure communities agreements with, the, with federal, federal government. Like, how, does it, how do the counties get in on this? Yeah. It seems to me that if, I mean, it seems to me that the counties are going to go where the money is. And at the same time, it puts a greater burden on the counties. So what I've seen is that there's kind of a divergence, depending on which county you're talking about and the people that are there. Um, I don't. I don't know who's going to win that battle, though. I don't. Well, it's, it's my sense that that $122 a night is a kickback that they get for holding prisoners. So in other words, yeah. I, I talked to this one jail. I think it was in um, Kentucky. And he said, yeah, we hate, we hate getting the people from our town. We really want to get those Marshalls people because they pay the big bucks. And, <laughs> and I guess that, you know, then the Marshalls can handle, if it's someone's really terrible and causing a problem, they can just send them back. Like, to, can we send somebody else if this guy is terrible and causing too much hassle for us? Um, so, yeah, no, the, the, a lot of, and, and there's a lot of spec building for a lot of small towns on building some of these prisons to come in and, 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 and 
don't worry, we're going to, the Marshalls is overburdened, and we're going to fill it with all kinds of, you know, very lucrative inmates, and uh, your whole facility is just going to be, you know, federal inmates, you don't have to worry about anything else. And then it's, it's worked out, it's worked out okay for some communities, but there are a couple communities that really got stuck holding the bag, and are now sitting on an empty facility that can't be, what are you going to turn, you know, a prison into? And it doesn't really make like a daycare center. And so, <laughs> so they're and so they're stuck with this empty prison, and then there's no there's no contracts coming, and there's no inmates to fill it. And so there's a big there's a big grassroots movement. I think some of the towns coming up seem to talk them better about this, and I can just sort of fend off these efforts by private private prison companies to come in and. and you know, speculate, speculatively build a prison that they hope somebody else will fill. Yes? I'm from Birmingham. Um, the, uh, the bill was by, written by Scott Beeson, an attorney. It's a 70 page bill. Uh, there are two, he's a state senator. There are two senators and the, and the, and the, uh, the new governor who were analyzed to create this. The faith community has, has demonstrated a, a major opposition to it. And the academic and the uh, uh, economic community is, has been very much injured by it. But there's also uh, a, um, a a prison for uh, you know, commercial prison in state. Is there any link there? I mean, this is very interesting. Um, you mean a link between the building of the the private prison? I think. Well, I think that the prison companies are looking for an opportunity to fill those prisons. And I think that when you've got an, an empty one, and some states like California don't, won't allow private prisons, they've tried, but the, the Correctional Officers Union in California is just is too powerful. Um, but if there's, an empty, if there's an empty facility that they're sitting on, that's a facility that's not making any money. And so they're going to look for any sort of opportunity to grab a new contract or get a state contract under their belt and, 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 and do that. They want to move, I think in Arizona, CCA wants to move out some of its uh, other inmates from another state and move in other ones. They're sort of like shipping the deck chairs to kind of cover the, the empty beds. Um, I'm from California, and uh, Geo just took over a, Did a really? city, a city or, or a state prison, a city or county. Oh, a uh, county facility. A county, uh, um, yeah. Adelanto, okay. Geo. Yeah. And they were opening it up in August 1st. Really? And we, the archdiocese, the diocese of San Bernardino tried to get the chaplain position to, you know, oversee to make sure that the chaplain there was, you know, yeah. meeting the contract with yeah. non security. And um, they're very close. It was trying to get a number for them was really hard. But I got it, but you they never called you back. You are preaching to the choir. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I, I'm yeah. a chaplain. And like, There's I'm, not. When you have a private prison, you can't, there's no open, there's no, there's, they have no incentive to allow media in or even pick up the phone and answer your question. You usually just get statements back over email um, because they have nothing to gain from that and only something to lose. And they don't want the oversight of their facilities. If it's a state prison, there's, even in the most closed states, and I have been in prisons in probably 30 states at this point. Even in the most closed, restricted prisons, there's still an opportunity to interview an inmate. There's still an opportunity to take a tour, and it, it might be without recording devices. It might be what you know, whatever the rules are. But you can still get in there. And I have not had. I've never been able to do that with a private prison. Hi. Uh, in this past year and the Louisiana legislature, two uh, Arizona copycat bills were introduced. And when the state representatives were before the committees and they were kind of cross-examined about the bills, it became very apparent that neither one had a, really a clue what was in the bill, which made us think, well, maybe they got this from Alex. Now, I wanted to, you mentioned that, that, that you can't get the names of the legislators that are members of Alex, from right. Alex and that it's not considered lobbying. Right. So how would we at the state, you know, in our various states, find out um, if, if, if legislators are getting, or members of Alex? Well, I would definitely look at their financial disclosure forms because a lot of states, they will say, I accepted a gift of $100 or more from the American Legislative Exchange Council. Um, there's also, sometimes, on, their, on Alex's website, I probably shouldn't say this, but uh, 
they have uh, they have initiatives where they want to send it up to Capitol Hill in DC and they will uh, get a whole bunch of their members to sign that initiative like the anti-Obama health care measure and so they list them by states and so sometimes you can get a good list <laughs> of a lot of the people that are there um, they've closed off a bunch of their websites they've been under a lot of criticism this past year and it's significantly they put their task force board members behind closed walls now. Mm -hmm. You can no longer see the private corporations or the lawmakers that are on the task force boards deciding which legislation they're going to move through. So it's getting more and more difficult. Yeah. Call me. <laughs> Take some other ideas. <laughs> are they are they only kind of right leaning? Is it is it? Uh, it's largely right leaning. I think ninety eight percent of their membership is Republican, and it's. Um, you know, it's uh, like six million dollars a year comes from big corporations. So yeah, and there's the equivalent, the national. Um, that's name slipping my mind. But somebody said to me, well, what's the difference between the National Council on State Legislators, lawmakers, legislation, something? Um, what's the difference between the, what they do and what you know the National Council does? They have a conference every year and they bring lawmakers. And the difference is that Alec has money and Sam <laughs> does not. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, it's just not as it's not as big. They don't they don't have quite the draw that Alec has for some of these lawmakers. I mean, they paid you know their whole trip out there. The, the past, last year, this summer was in New Orleans. It was a week long trip to New Orleans and you know, expensive childcare. So I'm supposed to wrap up now, but thank you so much. This has been great. <laughs>